and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, as a group and as solo artists. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 73, and the forthcoming Volume 2, 1974 to 1980. And I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. He also has his own YouTube channel, which you should check out, packed with Beatles-related interviews and things. And it's called Ken Michaels Radio on YouTube. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Good to be back. Yeah, it seems be... like just a few days. <laughs> we should do this more often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also Darren DeVivo, who's been a DJ at WFUVFM 90.7 in the New York area since 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him anyway and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. Hello. Gee, yeah, we got to stop meeting like this twice in one week. Yeah, right, right. Um, well, you know, we took so much time off so I could finish the book that um, we need to catch up with a lot of stuff. A um, few days ago, we had a chat with Bruce Spicer and Al Sussman about the Beatles' 60th anniversary of, 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 of their first visit to the US, but that conversation sort of went in all kinds of different directions. Um, we could have done it for another two hours. There's always plenty to say about that stuff. So um, what we're doing now is we're doing sort of a news catch up show because in the last couple of months, uh, mm -hmm. really an awful lot of interesting stuff has happened and we haven't been here to do our news segment. And um, we thought we would, catch up with that and also discuss the various things that uh, that require discussion among the news items. So over to Ken. Yeah, so this is going to be a mixture of very current news and kind of older news. It's very possible that you may not have heard some of the older news that it was first announced. So uh, yeah, we've got a lot of making up to do. And we'll start by uh, just reminding everybody that Yoko Ono uh, turned 91 on February the 18th. God bless her. And, uh, you know, I always say when you get up there in age, every day is a blessing. And we're so thankful for what she's continuing to do to carry on John's legacy. Happy birthday to Yoko. George Harrison would have been 81 had he lived on February 25th. Um, we note the passing on February 22nd of John Duff Lowe, the English pianist who played with the Quarrymen at the age of 16 when he appeared on the very first recordings made by the group in a recording studio. The two songs were That'll Be the Day and In Spite of All the Danger, which were both released on the Beatles Anthology Volume 1. Lowe attended the Liverpool Institute with Paul and George. And Duff, as he was known to his friends, knew Paul McCartney since 1953, and Paul invited him to join the band in 1958. Duff sold the recordings to Paul in 1981 for 12,000 pounds, and Paul had the songs remastered for inclusion in the anthology. Duff later went and played on the Quarrymen album called, uh, for, called Open for Engagements, of which only he and Rod Davis were the only members to have played in the Quarrymen in the 1950s. And while Duff was not an original member of the Quarrymen, he toured with Colin Hanton, Rod Davis, and Len Gary at Beatle events around the world until 2017. John Duff Lowe was 81. Anyone care to comment on that? Just sad that another piece... <clears throat> of the Beatles his story, the Beatles history has has gone. I never met him. Yeah, I know he was a I don't know if he I think he was I don't know if he was ever a fest guest, a fest for Beatles fans, but when the quarrymen came through, he wasn't playing with them at the time. In fact, I think Pete Shotton 
the first time, at least, that I saw the Quarrymen at Beetle Fest, I believe Pete Shotton was still playing with them. Hmm. I think it was Len Gary, who would sometimes be on his own as a guest, Colin Hanton, Rod Davis, Pete Shotton. I don't know if that, if that was just the four of them, but I never met John Duffalo, but it was sad to hear uh, that, you know, this part of, you know, Beatle history is, has passed on. Yeah. I know that um, Paul has talked about when he's given his concerts before he plays in spite of all the danger, which he's been doing for quite some time now, that when they made this, this shellac disc, there was only one copy made. And so I think John was the first one to take it home with him. And then it went to, to Paul or to George, to George, to Colin Hanton. And then John Duffalo was the last one who had it. And he kept it for like 20, 25 years. So, but the important thing is, apart from being in the Quarrymen, if it wasn't for John Duffalo keeping his copy all these years, we yeah. wouldn't have it in the Beatles anthology. So we have to be grateful for that. But sad to hear of this passing. <clears throat> the biggest news about the Beatles, which received a lot of publicity, is that director Sam Mendes, known for his work on the films No Time to Die, American Beauty, Skyfall, and 1917, is partnering with Sony to work on four biopics, one for each of the Beatles, done from the perspective of each Beatle. It marks the first time that the band's company, Apple Corps, has given permission for the group's life story and music to be used in a scripted film about them. Pippa Harris, who will produce the films, told Deadline that Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr have given their blessings to work on the four films. She says it's a testament to his creative brilliance and powers of persuasion that Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, Sean Lennon, and Olivia Harrison responded with such warmth and enthusiasm as soon as he spoke with them, meaning Sam Mendes. Harris also said that Mendes will have no restrictions on what he depicts from the band members' lives. She says what is truly exciting is for Sam to have the freedom to delve into the lives of each of the Beatles with nothing off limits and no sense of the band wanting him to tell a particular authorized version of their rise to success. So this got a lot of attention, obviously, and the mere fact that these are going to be four films in a theatrical release, and uh, they're saying 2027 is when it should be coming out. We'll be having actors playing each of the four Beatles. What do you guys think about this? This is a big undertaking. Yeah. Um, you know, I can see the... Uh at the Oscars, you know, the award for the most fraught project <laughs> with the biggest possibilities of disaster are, it goes to. Um, yeah, you know, um, I, I, I'd, I'd love to read his pitch documents and, you know, and hear the arguments because as we know, the Beatles and Apple have not notably been open to this kind of thing in the past. Um, they, they've barely been open even to allowing Beatles recordings to be used in, in films or Beatles music. Um, you know, there, there, there have been some, uh, mostly the music has to be covers. Um, and, and some people have made a virtue of that, you know, across the universe and I am Sam. Um, but yesterday. Yeah. It, yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's uh, I mean, the 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 pitfalls are incredible. Um, it is sort of an interesting idea, this idea of four interlocking films from four points of view. Um, I don't know if you guys know um there's a British playwright, Alan Akeborn. Um, he did a a a series of three plays called The Norman Conquests, and they all take place in a country house in England over a weekend. And the first play, well, I don't know what, what number, it doesn't matter which number it is because there are three independent, independent plays, but they're interlocking in the sense that one takes place in the kitchen over the three days, one takes place outside the house, and one takes place in the living room. And 
you know, you can see like in one place, someone goes, you know, out of the kitchen screaming something. And then the next night in the living room play, you can hear them screaming out of the kitchen and coming into the living room and all of these things interlock. And it's finally the complete story once you've seen all three. Um, and and this idea of, of the Beatles story from all four points of view sort of strikes me as possibly like that, except that a lot of the time they were all in the same room. So um, I'll be curious to see how you can have the four points of view. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, I'll be curious. It's 2027. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. The one thing I'm really confused about, because there was one article that I read about this, where it made it sound like it's the story of the Beatles, and they don't really say if they go into the solo careers at all. But it's almost like the four of them chronologically, bit by bit, and all four of them are in the film. Whereas I thought originally there'd be one film, just John Lennon telling his story with the actor playing John Lennon, and and then Paul McCartney had another one, and then one for George and one for Ringo, separate ones that way, instead of all four of them being in the film gradually telling the story about the same events as it's happening. We don't really know yet, I think. Yeah, it's an unusual concept, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does. It, it can be, and there's going to be a lot of time for this project to fall apart. Um, and we've seen projects of, of you know, uh, large-scale projects not come to fruition but if this does come off it has the makings of either being brilliant or 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 a disaster um but still incredibly intriguing um you know it's almost like uh you know you, you everyone tells a different side of the story so i guess this is going to be expanded to um to four films i just wonder how they're going to release them if they're going to be put out you know, like separated by X number of months or something or come out all at the same time. Um, um, and in this day and age, now who knows where we'll be when it comes to the cinema in 2027 um, between being able to watch films at home, having to go to the theater first or, you know, by 2027, it may all be you know, home viewing, and then it really wouldn't matter how they put them out. Um, but it's, it bears watching. Um, although we probably won't get many updates over this period of time on how the film's progressing. Uh, but we'll see. It's, it's intriguing. There isn't a lot of good Beatle films when it comes to dramatizations, uh, not documentaries. They're very, very, very hit and miss. Backbeat was one of the better ones, I thought. Mm -hmm. There was also some, you know, and I can't even think of, uh, there was that one, and I don't remember if I, I liked it or not so long ago, that I know Aiden Quinn played Paul McCartney. It was McCartney and two Lennon. Of two of oh, us? Two of us, right. I don't even remember how I felt about that when I saw it. I remember thinking Backbeat was better than it was, than I anticipated it being. Yeah, uh, and I'm not into musicals, so I really had little to no interest in um, across the universe. I watched, started watching it, and I didn't even make it five minutes in, you know. <laughs> and yesterday was cute, but it didn't hold me. Um, the hours and times, the one about John and and Brian going to Spain. I don't know if I've seen that one. Actually, but it was a sort of artsy film, you know, which um, which I think gave it some some cred and it was it was well done um you know having having mentioned the alan akeborn three plays um I, I i should probably also of course mention the japanese film rashomon which is you know the same story from multiple points of view but all in one film hmm. so um so this this goes way beyond that apparently well this seems to be the era of the biopic yeah. You witnessed the success of Rocket Man, the Elton John film, and Bohemian Rhapsody, and now the one on Bob Marley. You know, this seems to be the right time for biopics. So maybe it's jumping on the latest 
I don't know, a trend. Yeah. But uh, I, I think... hope it's not like those. The, I hope these Beatles films aren't like those because, I mean, I saw Rocket Man in the theaters and I thought it was okay, but I tend to end up watching these movies with wanting, bi wanting a biography and wanting something factual. And you could tell where it was obvious the story was um, uh, was enhanced for, for Hollywood and it jumped around and it wasn't factually accurate. I'm constantly leaning over to my wife going, Elton, put this song out before. All right, I'll shut, I'll shut up now. Um, <laughs> I thought the I thought Bohemian Rhapsody was really good, and I had Elvis gave me a headache. It was an assault on the senses, I thought. Um, and I haven't seen Bob Marley, and I'm probably I don't know, hmm. not too enthused with the uh, you know Broadway. I want facts. I don't want to come away from a movie thinking, did he really kick that guy in the ass and he went down the hill? I don't think that really happened. I can't. You know, I want to see a movie that I know that there's it's based on fact. Hmm. Well, we'll see if, if you guys are in favor of this, because they're saying here in this information that Sam Mendez is getting complete control over the whole project. I would hope that Paul and Ringo would watch this. And if there's anything wrong, you know, that they would that they would have some input. As well as as some. Um, Olivia and Sean. Remember uh, when Nowhere Boy came out, um, Paul did some interviews where he said he went to the director and said to her, you know, it didn't really happen that way. And she said, well, you know, Paul, it, it's a film. It's, you know, it's not a documentary. Um, I personally prefer documentaries, but, um, you know, I'll be curious. I'll be curious to see it. Yeah. But, you know, like Darren, I'll be sitting there, uh, you know, with Paula sort of being the live footnotes. <laughs> Didn't really That's happen like that. Five years after. <laughs> Just so. eat your popcorn and watch the movie. <laughs> okay. More news, and there's plenty of it. Several weeks ago now, um, some big news came from Ringo himself in his latest video update. He revealed that at the moment he is working on a country album, not an EP. Album. Remember that? <laughs> in an interview that Gary Burr gave us on the Talk More Talk pod podcast, Gary said that Ringo's album will have more of a traditional country sound, not like the more modern country. And Gary has written a song for the album, but couldn't give us the title. In the meantime... Coming very soon will be Ringo's next EP called Crooked Boy, produced by Linda Perry. Linda also wrote all the songs, and Ringo's video shows the song titles and lyrics as well. The titles for the EP are Gonna Need Someone, Crooked Boy, February Sky, and Adeline. Ringo also displayed his latest book, Beats and Threads, which illustrates all the drum kits Ringo has used through the years and the clothes he wore in the 60s and 70s. The book is available through juliansauctions.com. And Ringo mentioned that in May and June, Ringo and the All-Stars will be on tour. We already mentioned he has six dates in Las Vegas. He just added another six dates for that tour. And he plans to do another one uh, in September and October. You should always check the tour tab on Ringo's website to see if he's adding more shows at ringostar.com. But um, when I heard that news about the country album, I was just so elated because fans have wanted that for a long time, ever since Buku's of Blues. And every now and then he'd slip in a country song on his albums. But he's so right at home vocally and his love for country music and more the old style country mm -hmm. than I think we're all going to be very pleased when that comes out. The EP, I believe, um, it's, it's not record store day release too. Record store, but um, um, I couldn't figure out whether or not it's going to be on vinyl, and the vinyl is a record store day release, right? Uh, sometimes that means, of course, limited, and it'll disappear eventually. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know, and then I thought I heard somewhere that there might be two pressings, colored vinyl and a black vinyl, then of course I'm assuming a CD will come out maybe as as the 
regular release. I don't know, but they are all tied in to April 20th, to record store day. Crooked yeah. Boy. And uh, we'll get to in a few minutes. Okay. Um, also, Paul McCartney's 50th anniversary of Band on the Run was released on February the 2nd, including an underdub mix of the album. Band on the Run is also available in Dolby Atmos. And in celebration of the new release, the, the videos for Mamunia and Helen Wheels have been remastered in 4K and are now available on YouTube. Did you get to hear, because you're into the Atmos stuff, Alan, yeah. have you heard the Band on the Run mix? Yes, I've I've only uh, been able to hear it once, but lots of little parts that were buried are now audible. Um, in particular, the most striking one really is there's a, a guitar solo near the end of 1985, um, very close to the end of it. And that's, uh, you know, when you go back and listen to the record, you can kind of hear it, but it's very buried and now it's a bit more prominent. And, uh, and there's a lot of stuff like that. It's a, it's a, a very, a very nice spacious mix. Um, it, it actually, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to make the album, the normal album, sound as if it's unexciting because it's you know one of his more exciting albums. But there is like a jump in the level of just sheer visceral excitement hearing the Atmos. Um, it it was a really good experience. Um, I look, look forward to hearing that again. Um, the underdub mix. There mm -hmm. is a lot of. Um, speculation about what those actually are even though it says on the record what they actually are which is a mix that was done on october 14th 1973 um it's kind of interesting because we didn't notice a mix of everything on the album in the sort of tape logs that we had looked at um you know for that date um, but the logs are sometimes not absolutely complete or absolutely accurate. Um, so they could have been from some other time, but you look at the calendar, October 14th was a Sunday. Um, Paul tended really not to work on Sundays. I mean, he did sometimes, uh, and, and, and this could have been one of those times because the album was getting so close to being complete, but, um, it also could have been mixed just by Jeff Emmerich. Um, but usually Paul liked to be there when the mixes were being done. So that's mystery number one. If it's October 14th, which is a Sunday, you know, is that really the right date? And is and and was it Paul and Jeff or was it just Jeff or whatever? Now, the 14th, I believe, was the day that he had Tony Visconti come to his house and listen to him play through some stuff uh, and say what he wanted the arrangements to be. The recording session wasn't until the 17th and uh, for the orchestral stuff. So people who've been speculating, well, so did they just take the orchestral stuff off? No, the orchestral stuff wasn't there yet on the 14th. Um, mm -hmm. This could have been a, a, a set made for Tony Visconti um, to guide him in in doing his arrangements, but I believe he has said that he was not allowed to take a tape. So um, he does say that uh, he sat down with Paul at Paul's piano and Paul played him a tape and played him on the piano, you know, ideas about what he wanted done um, and then gave Tony, Tony only three days to actually write the orchestrations for, I think, seven songs, um, and then come in and conduct the orchestrations. This is why Tony was a little bit upset at really not getting credit on the album cover as, you know, arranger and conductor. It says, like, you know, thanks, Tony, or something, you know, which if you're a, a professional musician making a career doing things like arrangements and conducting, you want it known that, that's you on this album. So uh, anyway, that that's what those mixes seem to be. They seem to be, you know, whatever state those tracks were in on the 14th. Um, 
it it is causing uh you know one issue for us which is that we have uh the lead vocal and background vocal for i think it was 1985 being done on october 10th and this version has backing vocals but it doesn't have the lead vocal so there are a number of possibilities maybe he did a vocal on the 10th and then decided that he didn't like it and had Jeff do the mix without the lead vocal, but with the background vocals, um, which would mean that it, uh, there was a, there were sessions on the 15th and 16th before the orchestral session. He could have added the final vocal on one of those two days. So if we get to revise the book, we uh, will have to account for that. You know, the whole concept of underdub mixes has started some people in the sort of internet bootleg world, making what they're calling underdub mixes of other albums. And, you know, you have to be really careful with stuff like this because, you know, when Paul put this out, he's saying, this is the underdub mix, but he's also saying, this is a mix of all these tracks that were made on October 14th, 1973. Someone did an underdub mix of Red Rose Speedway and it's really interesting listening, but it's kind of not real in the sense that, for instance, you play My Love and it doesn't have the orchestral track and it sounds really kind of interesting. But then when you get to the guitar solo, Henry's guitar solo is there. We know that Henry recorded his guitar solo live with the orchestra during the orchestral session. Oh. So this isn't a recording that actually exists in reality. And so you, you just have to sort of be careful listening to it and, and, and how you think of it as, you know, is this some stage for this song in its development? Well, no, it actually isn't. But it is stripping everything away so you can hear a lot of interesting stuff that you don't normally hear. And that's the thing, you know, we'll probably get into more of this when we talk about this at length, but... To me, this reminds me of the concept of stripped down <laughs> from Double Fantasy. It's taking away the horns. It's taking away the orchestration. It's just the band. And sometimes they'll take vocals that were double tracked and just give you one track. Right. So it sounds even more live and more real. And people are really into that these days. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the reason why Paul released this is because he's aware of that. You know, I mean, some of the songs, there are noticeable differences with new vocals. Um, and some of them, there's hardly a difference at all from the re release versions. Yeah, but we'll yeah. talk about that more um, probably in our next show. Okay. Um, Christie's auction just sold what is believed to be the only painting made by all four Beatles called Images of a Woman. The Beatles collaborated on this painting while they stayed at the Tokyo Hilton Hotel in 1966 while they played at the Budokan Arena there for five shows. It was expected to fetch between four hundred and six hundred thousand dollars and $600,000, and all four Beatles signed the painting. It did much better than that. It sold for $1.7 million on February the 1st. Christie specialist Casey Rogers says, It's such a rarity to have a work on paper outside of their music catalog that is a physical relic. This tangible object with contributions from all four Beatles of the Beatles, from all four of the Beatles, it's, mem it's memorabilia, it's a work of art, it appeals to probably a much larger cross-section of collectors, it's a wonderful piece of storytelling. Was there any information on why that they did this uh, painting in the first place? They were stuck in their hotel room and they were bored. Okay. They had pain. Oh, the the promoter for the tour actually brought them all the art supplies and suggested <laughs> to do something with it. And they weren't supposed to leave their hotel room. Right. Here, play so, with me. Paul did, however. <laughs> I, I heard John did too. John and Paul together escaped a couple of times. It actually sounds like when, you know, when the kids were little and you go out to the restaurant and you give them crayons and <laughs> crayons in the back of the menu and the diner. Here, draw a picture for me. Um, that's funny. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Let's discuss the record store day releases. Mm. 
Thank you, Darren, for supplying me with all this information here. There's several uh, items of interest for Beatle fans. The Beatles Limited Edition Record Store Day 3 Turntable. Um, this is uh, a Bluetooth enabled, and it is housed in a Beatle box that includes the four songs they performed. The four songs. There were five songs. It says the four songs they performed 60 years ago on the Ed Sullivan Show on four three-inch records. Each record is housed in an outer box with a picture sleeve and poster. The package also includes a Beatles branded carrying case, which holds up to 10 three inch records. The songs are She Loves You, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Till There Was You, and I Saw Her Standing There, and all four three inch singles will be available individually. They don't say whether or not it's the performances on the Ed Sullivan show that they're releasing here. I'm assuming it's just the ones in the studio. Probably. So any mixes on those? Any what? At most mixes on the, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Yet another item I don't really need, but that sounds like it would be a kind of like a fun little novelty item. And with a little case that holds 10, you know that future record store days will have further Beatles three inch singles. They'll release a total of 11 so that they have to then manufacture a second box to store that one in, and then we're off to the races. They'll try to uh, add all the other songs from the other Ed Sullivan shows and put them <laughs> on singles. <laughs> okay, the Mind Games EP from John Lennon. This is a limited edition four-track 12-inch EP. It's supposed to be a teaser for the big box set reissue. There'll be two color variants, the Luminous Glow in the Dark 140-gram colored vinyl, and a 180 gram black vinyl edition. The tracks are Mind Games, The Ultimate Mix, I'm the Greatest will be on there. The Ultimate Mix featuring George and Ringo, I Assume a Sen, I'm Sorry, The Ultimate Mix, and You Are Here, the outtake of that, take five. Okay, so we'll be getting that a couple of months before the Mind Games box set comes out. Um, also, George Harrison, Wonderwall Music and Electronic Sound. Both albums will be released as picture discs on Dark Horse Records. This will start a multi-year partnership between Dark Horse Records and Record Store Day to release limited Zotrope picture disc pressings of George Harrison's entire studio album catalog. The records are individually numbered in silver foil and include an insert reproducing the original artwork. 8,000 units globally. Okay, so all of George's albums will be released this way. You guys going to go for that? <laughs> Possibly. Have you seen the Zoetrope pressing? No, I haven't. Um, yeah. Uh, Adrian got one for our editor and brought it to, uh, you know, Fest to to give to her. And um, it, it, it really is incredible because it's not just a picture disc it's a picture disc that as the disc spins the picture kind of moves oh cool you know it's 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 really interesting and really beautiful to see so and you know and considering that george was you know into the sort of you know hindu art that we've discussed in the past like when we were talking about um the, uh, living in the material sure. world you know i can imagine that the pictures that they're going to come up with for the zoetrope pressings are going to be kind of interesting so yeah i definitely want to want to get those actually that's making me very curious. Mm -hmm. They're doing other act artists, some are other artists as well. I think, a, I think they're doing a a Blur album on Record Store Day. Park Park is it Parkside or Park Life? I'm drawing a blank. Park. But anyway, they're doing that type of picture disc also, so it's hitting on other artists for this Record Store Day. But yeah, it really. And now I thought it was pretty interesting. The Dark Horse. I think we had discussed this though. Is reissuing essentially apple albums uh if it says all of his studio albums yeah well the first two wonderwall music and electronic sound are apple right coming dark horse so well, yeah we but... knew that did we not i mean we knew the dark horse was taking over george's catalog i seem to vaguely remember we weren't certain did uh -huh. that 
Apple stuff as well. Yeah. Well, there was the the they reissued Wonderwall music and electronic sound recently. Going back a few years for that. Um and they they uh they put out a CD with bonus tracks. I don't know how many years back we're going there. Um, yeah. It's all blur. Uh, it's starting to really all blur now. But the plans that were announced at a press conference right before COVID was just discussing all through the Dark Horse album and tour. They didn't say anything beyond that. But the way this reads, I take it to mean that it's all of the studio oh. album through Brainwashed. Yeah, interesting. But those will be fun, yeah. Okay. Um, then there's the Ringo Starr Crooked Boy single. There'll be a black and white marble vinyl 12 inch. It says here the songs are going to need someone in Crooked Boy, but then I've also seen that this is the full EP. I think that was a misprint. The two where they just mentioned two songs. Yeah. I think was a misprint. Okay. So it should be all four songs with February Sky and Adeline. Um, and as we said before, we're not sure when the CD will come out for that. It could be the same time. It could be shortly after that. But uh, yeah, tying in with Crooked Boy. So, and one more thing. Elton John's Caribou album from 1974 is coming out for its uh, 50th anniversary. It'll be a two LP set on Vivid Blue Sky Vinyl. And the bonus tracks on record two include a version of Snookaroo, the song that he gave to Ringo Starr for his Good Night Vienna album and played on it, written with uh, with Bernie Taupin, of course. I have heard a bootleg from years ago of just Elton. It's like a demo, just him on the piano doing Snookaroo. I have a feeling that's what this is. I don't know if it's a full band uh, arrangement of the song. But for those of us who have to have everything, yep. there'll be a recording of Snookaroo on Caribou. Okay, that's all the Record Store Day releases. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We have an official word on Elliot Mintz's upcoming book, which will be called We All Shine On, John, Yoko, and Me. It's due out October 22nd, and it's described as a personal and revealing look at the last 10 years of John Lennon's life, written by the friend who knew them best, publicist and music insider, uh, Elliot Mintz. And Elliot tells a story of, of his relationship with the couple, which continues to this day with his close friendship to Yoko. Amazon describes the book, Mintz transports readers from his first interview with Yoko in 1971 through the years that he supported the couple, both personally and professionally, through creative highs, relationship and private challenges, fascinating interactions with the other former Beatles and the happiest moments of their lives together, Sean Lennon's birth and childhood. And of course, Elliot was uh, by Yoko's side after uh, John was murdered, the days, weeks, and months after John's murder. And uh, when Elliot eventually became the official spokesperson of the Lennon estate. So something to mark down right there. He was a tremendous guest on our show several years ago elliot mintz's new book uh coming out october 22nd is his book going to deal just with his relationship with john and yoko or his various other you know he was dylan's spokesman for a while too and and if you look at his facebook page periodically i mean he's he's always got these really interesting stories involving all kinds of people so be uh be interesting if he if he expands beyond just john and yoko not that I shouldn't say just John and Yoko, like it's nothing. Yeah. But right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Pamphlet. But um, yeah, that's just based on the Amazon description. I was kind of surprised with the title because it's really focusing just by the title on John Yoko and him. Yeah. But there's so much more to his story than that. And if you look at his website, he's got loads of really good interviews that he's done through the years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lots of celebrities and musicians. So 
I would kind of look forward to knowing what he had to say about each of them. Okay, um, got a bit more news here. Like I said, a lot of catching up. Since we just celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America, here's another 60th anniversary about to be celebrated, the release of John Lennon's book in his own right. This will take place at the Liverpool Beatles Museum on Matthew Street on March 22nd. Julian Lennon is one of the many contributors for the show. Another person involved in the event will be someone that Darren just wrote about on Facebook. Danger, danger. Will Robinson. Billy Mumy will be there for this uh, special event. I just think it's really cool that they're acknowledging this. You'd think it would just be, you know, the Beatles and their music, but they're they're pinpointing John's first book here in his own right. It's interesting, too, that this is at Rogue Best Museum, isn't it? Yeah. So that's kind of interesting because, you know, for the entire Beatles era as it was and, and through the solo years, there was always sort of a distance between the Beatles and Pete. And so now, like, here's a, a sort of, you know, semi-official function, you know, that, that that various people are getting involved with, like Julian, um, that's that's in Rogue Best Museum. So, mm. it, you know, maybe that maybe those uh, threads are getting, you know, back together a, a bit, you know, instead of there being, you know, opposing camps about, you know, everything. Yeah, sure would be nice if if. Uh... Paul or Ringo just met with Pete, talked to him. It's got to be an awkward thing. <laughs> it must be, yeah. Even still, after all these years. Sure. You know, the fact that Neil Aspinall was Rogue's dad and everything, and he worked for the Beatles at the same time. and Yeah, yeah. I, for I forgot that. I it must have made it even more difficult for Pete during those years. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and like, some of the medals on the Sergeant Pepper costumes were Pete's dad's that Neil went and got and brought back, you know, to, so they had some medals. So there's, 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 there's a, a lot here, um, you know, more than has met the eye, let's say. Mm. There's a book someone can do. That's what Ringo said in help. <laughs> that meets the eye. Mm. All right. Speaking of Julian. He will have a coffee table size book of his photos coming out October 29th this year. Amazon UK describes, describes it as a book by the musician, visionary, and photographer presenting an opulent panorama of unique perspectives. From breathtaking landscapes to haunting portraits, this masterpiece not only offers visual splendor, but also provides authentic insights into the artist's world of thought and fascinating texts. A journey of discovery into the diversity of a man who masters both the stage and the viewfinder. Very, very complimentary there to Julian. I've seen a lot of his photos and they're wonderful. I love his nature shots. It's funny, he, you know, we started we started this this uh, episode as a news show, but I feel like almost like we're turning into the Beatles shopping channel. You know, <laughs> it's like every bit of news is going to cost us something. <laughs> Well, this is like a month and a half to two months of news here. <laughs> uh, and there's always a few things that I've left out. Uh, I'm sure you heard about this. Patty Boyd is auctioning off love letters that Eric Clapton wrote to her during the love triangle between them and George Harrison. They're about to be auctioned by Christie's this month, offering an unprecedented look at the beginning of Eric's romance with Patty. In one letter from 1970, Eric wrote... I am writing this letter to you with the main purpose of ascertaining your feelings towards a subject well known to both of us. What I wish to ask you is if you still love your husband. All these questions are very impertinent, I know, but if there is still a feeling in your heart for me, you must let me know. Now, Patty says initially she thought the letters from Clapton were from a weird fan. She had no idea it was from Eric, and she even showed them to George. Also in the auction are photos of George and Patty together, letters from George to Patty, and even a painting that Eric gave to George by Emile Theodore Franzden de Schomburg. The Patty Boy collection is being auctioned online by Christie's 
from March 8th to the 21st. And the public auction view takes place at Christie's in London from March 15th to the 22nd. I believe there are some of George's handwritten lyrics in that collection, too. Really? Yeah. Um, Christie's has, if you go to Christie's and, and look for that auction, you'll see an online catalog with all of the stuff. And and some of them were um, were handwritten lyrics, the songs. I can't remember which songs. I, um, I did, you know... <laughs> They have it set up so that you can, you know, you could get a screen capture by getting a screen capture and then editing out, you know, the square with the the, the lyric in it. But you can't um, you can't just save it as a, a JPEG or something like that, which is uh, what I sort of would have wanted to do. They know what they're doing. Yep. Um, you can always go to the I Me Mind book because a lot of his stuff is handwritten in there. That's true. That's true. I haven't I haven't checked whether the ones that are shown are included in the I Me Mind book. Um, they might not be, uh, but yeah, I should check that. Okay, this is among the newest of news items: three rediscovered cassette tapes that contain music and conversation from the Beatles are being auctioned, made on Ringo Starr's own cassette recorder. Uh, they include clips from the Beatles' 1966 tour of Germany, Japan, and the Philippines. Among the recordings is a demo of Ringo's song, Don't Pass Me By, and the sound of Ringo performing on the piano. Manager Brian Epstein is also heard discussing how to import valuable goods from Japan to the UK without paying high taxes. Another recording is from the group's first trip to India, where they experimented with traditional instruments. Omega Auctions manager Dan Muscatelli Hampson said, these tapes are truly a remarkable discovery. Hours of previously unheard material from such a pivotal period will be of huge interest to Beatle experts, fans, and collectors in the fact that they were made by Ringo himself and contain such intimate scenes with the band from the tour is just incredible. He said the tapes include the band simply messing around and having a laugh during what was a famously difficult tour. The sale will take place by Omega Auctions, and that's on March 26th. Okay. I wonder if this tape of them painting the painting. <laughs> you know, on YouTube, uh, they actually have a clip from one of those cassettes, and you hear Ringo playing Don't Pass Me By on the Piano. Right. And it sounds exactly the same as he does in concert now, playing it on the piano for a few bars. His playing is exactly the same. So it's nice to have that on the cassette and knowing that it was dated from that time. All right. So we got some news here on the Beatles kids, although we already mentioned Julian. Danny Harrison's most recent album, Inner Standing, was released digitally back in October. And it was just released february 12th on both cd and on vinyl there's supposed to be a 2lp yellow vinyl edition for that and uh also there's a new video that danny made which you can check out on youtube called icu that's the letters icu okay james mccartney is back with a new song called beautiful which will be which actually came out digitally on february the 23rd and uh, there's a video for that already on YouTube. An EP is planned for release later this year. And James's music is actually being produced by someone that Paul has worked with, David Kahn. So it's good to hear from James. It's been many years. 2007 was his last album. Oh. Oh, so, wow, I didn't realize it was that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen him in concert. I think he, mm -hmm. his voice is so strong. Yeah. His playing is really good. Yeah, there's a lot of talent there, but he didn't seem, and I've pointed this out, I interviewed him at WFUV, he didn't necessarily seem comfortable in the spotlight. Um, and having to do publicity behind his releases seemed to be a little difficult. Uh -huh. for him. Uh, and while, you know, he doesn't reinvent the wheel or anything, there's definitely some talent there. Um uh, there's some really good songs that he's put out on, I guess, one or two. 
I'm, one full length album, right? And an EP, I think, or I think he started with an EP, and he's had a couple of albums. Uh, maybe two, yeah. Um, but I saw him at Rockwood Music Hall, probably maybe where you saw him. Did you see him at the Rockwood Music Hall in New York City? No, I actually saw him at a small club in New Haven, Connecticut. Did it have seats? It was probably nice. <laughs> I um, stood. Not many. <laughs> actually, I saw him in another small club in Connecticut, but I can't remember the name of it. But yeah, it was Cafe Nine. Okay. Cafe Nine was the one in New Haven. Okay, you could yeah, stand right up okay. to it. Um, I think for the for his first release, um, at Rockwood Music Hall in uh, NYC. Right, but he, it's well crafted stuff that he does. Yeah, uh, I just think he's he's really shy. Yeah. And a bit nervous. He might be opening up more now since he's been in the business a bit longer. But um, it's definitely worth checking out. The new single called Beautiful from James. Sean Lennon's new album is called Asterisms. It's an all-instrumental album featuring many prominent musicians from the New York area. It was first released digitally on February 16th, and you can now get it on CD and LP on Chimera Music. Okay, it actually came out on March the 1st. You can listen to the songs on YouTube. It's really good. It's uh, all instrumental stuff, kind of jazzy, a little progressive. You know, Sean dabbles in everything. Mm. <laughs> he really does. And uh, I love Ghost of a Sabertooth Tiger, which is really like alternative rock. And um, the progressive band that he was in. Uh, With Les Claypool. Les Claypool. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, Sean and Delirium. Lennon, yeah. if Sean Ono Lennon and Danny Harrison work together, I bet you they'd come up with something very fascinating. Well, you know, Sean's into everything, and a lot of what Danny does is very electronic and yeah. synthetic sounding, and he's into a lot of that stuff. So, But I think Sean could adapt to anything. Yeah. He really can. It's pretty amazing. All right. Speaking of Sean, he also just collaborated with the Lemon Twigs. Oh, yeah. For their new album, which is called The Dream Is All We Know, he co-produced a song in his upstate New York studio for them called In the Eyes of a Girl. And just a few more items here with Beatle-related people. Lawrence Juber has just... Uh, released another album of his wonderful guitar playing covering Beatles songs titled A Day in My Life. See how he combined that? A Day in the Life, In My Life. A Day in My Life. It's uh, 12 Beatles songs arranged by Lawrence, and it's available on album on 180 gram vinyl and on all streaming platforms. The songs were recorded at Abbey Road in Studio 2, where the Beatles recorded most of their music. And you can purchase signed copies by going to the LJ store at lawrencejuber.com. I also saw an interview with Lawrence on Edward Crawford's, Crawford's um, podcast called Me, Mr. Broad Street. And Lawrence said that uh, the new album will be available on CD probably in a few weeks from now. Mm. Okay. Billy J. Kramer was just a guest, as was Lawrence Juber. And Steve Holly at the Fest for Beatle fans. And he debuted his new single there, which uh, was just released digitally. It's called Are You With Me? That is uh, the title track of his new album, which was recorded at Abbey Road Studios as well in celebration of his 80th birthday. Lawrence Juber, Steve Holly, and Gary Burr all make special appearances on the album, which likely will be out in April. Really good song. Very poppy, yeah. very 60s feel. And uh, nice guitar work, as always, from Lawrence Juber on there. Just a few more things left. A band that toured America with the Beatles in 1966, The Circle, are releasing a new album called Revival, which will be out March 22nd on Big Stir Records. Original member Don Daneman is still with the group. He was actually at the Fest for Beatle fans. Might have been last year, I think. Last year or two years ago. Can't remember. Um and the album features appearances from Brian Wilson and Beach Boys and Monkeys alumni, Robin Gregory, who plays French horn on a new recording of their song, The Visit. You can pre-order the album at BigStirRecords.com. Speaking of Gary Burr, he told us on Talk More Talk, he's putting out a new book. 
This is the fan fiction book on the Beatles called Come Together. No doubt about a Beatles reunion. Pierce Hemmingson, who we know for his book, The Beatles in Canada, is coming out with the second volume of that in the spring, which you can now pre-order on Amazon. And a new single from our friend Jeff Slate. It's called Broken Without You. Has a new studio album coming out May 17th called The Last Day of Summer. Mm -hmm. And last but certainly not least, McCartney Legacy Volume 2 comes out December the 10th. Hmm. It's so, okay. Uh, We're all waiting for that. Yeah. Yeah, we hope. I mean, you know, with with volume one, I think there were several dates that um, came and went and uh, before it finally, finally came out. But um, we're, we're hoping December 10th sticks because, you know, it'd be nice to have it out by Christmas. Right. You know, sure. Um, Alan, have you started seriously started with volume three? Um, not really. I'm still sort of uh, unwinding from volume two. Um, you know, we're slowly beginning to get some of the materials together and to think about, you know, how we'll approach it, who we need to talk to that we haven't talked to yet. I mean, we've done some interviews that will, you know, that haven't been useful for volumes one and two, but will become useful for volume three. Um, we need to figure out who else, you know, should be in that list and uh, start doing that. But um, we haven't really started in earnest yet. You know, at some point for the rest of this year, we're going to have to be, we're going to have to read volume two again, at least twice, you know, and, and do the whole editing process and, uh, and all of that stuff. It, it gets really complicated, but um, there's, there's that to look forward to. <laughs> So for the moment, I'm just sort of unwinding in between writing and that stuff. Right, right. Um, a random question that will be touched on in two. Did you did you interview Jeff Britton for two? Yes, you did. Yeah, Adrian did. Adrian and Jeff actually became you know sort of friends. Um, so uh, yeah, Jeff doesn't generally speaking like to talk that much about it uh, anymore he, he lives in spain now and um but adrian had a, a number of interviews with him and you know and as with denny uh denny sywell uh he let us sort of go through his diary and um, establish dates and all of that stuff and there's a, a lot of interesting stuff in there so yeah, yeah. Okay. you know i would think gosh you never did talk to Jeff Emmerich, did you? He probably passed away by the time you started the book, right? Right, yeah. But he um, did write a book. Right. He did a lot of interviews. So we, you know, we have some information from him. And we have, um, I think we have some interviews he did with other people. You know, you sometimes can persuade people to give you their tape. Um, so we have, you know, Jeff is very represented as he was in volume one, mm. but you know, he becomes more important. He becomes <clears throat> in volume two, he becomes really McCartney's go-to engineer when he's available, which he isn't always, you know, because he has a job. He's working for George Martin at air. Um, and George at, at a certain point in volume two promoted him. Um which gave him more responsibility at air. So he couldn't just take off and work with Paul all the time. Mm. Um, so, so there were some other engineers too uh, involved, like Will for Venus and Mars, Alan O'Duffy um, did a lot of the engineering for that. And <laughs> excuse me. And we spoke to him. Yeah. So the whole book process is, is much more laborious than most people realize <laughs> Ken says this because because he sent me an email the other day okay. saying, well, how come it's taking so long if you're done with it now to come out? So I just sort of listed in a huge paragraph the number of things that have to be done now, um, now that the writing is finished before it actually comes out. And it, it, is, a, it is a pretty laborious process. But I'm kind of thinking that it's a similar thing that with, with what Mark Lewison's doing. Because Mark not only has to work on volume two, 
but he's also working on volume three at the same time because if there's any people that he can interview that were there at that time period he's got to get them now that's right so if you're offered an interview with someone that worked with mccartney in the 80s 90s and up you're mm -hmm. still going to take it because you never you could certainly use that later on sure absolutely yeah because we you know look a number of people who we interviewed for volume one and even volume two um, died before volume two was finished. Yeah. Uh, so we have like a little, you know, like, like in the Oscars and the Grammys when they have a little memorial for, right. We have a, a, a list of, you know, people who helped us and um, have, have passed on John Morris, for instance, John Morris was very yeah. important in volume one. Um, you know, he, uh, he was not that it, not that it's, particularly in the volume, but I mean, he was at Woodstock. He made a lot of those announcements, you know, that you hear on the recording. Yeah. Um, he sort of was managed the Fillmore East. He, he was very closely involved with, with uh, Graham and uh, Bill Graham. And uh, he knew Linda when she was a photographer, just shooting rock shows. You know, she'd hang out in his office at the Fillmore with a couple of other uh, writers and photographers uh, that he knew. And, um, you know, so it, he, he managed the 1972 Wings Tour. Uh, Paul well, yeah. invited him to become Wings manager, which he didn't want to do. Um, and in fact, actually, by the end of the 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 tour, they were not on the best of terms, you know. In fact, when we did the interview with him, um, you know, at the beginning of the interview, he said, so um, is Paul involved with this book? Is this a, a sort of an official function of MPL or, you know, anything like that? And I said, no, no, it's it's, it's totally independent. He's he's not participating in any way. Uh, and and John Morris said, "Well, okay, good. So I can I can tell it the way it really was." <laughs> so but he just died a couple of months ago. Um, so, yeah, yeah. By any chance, um, did you speak with Ken Womack at all um, regarding Mal Evans at this? particular time in the 70s because one of the things that i found really fascinating in in his book on mal was that paul asked mal if he'd be willing to help him with the wings over america tour which right. unfortunately he died right before that happened right so, yeah did you uncover anything about that or did you talk to ken about that at all? we talked we talked to ken because we knew that ken had mal's diaries and and yeah. you know was writing his own book about mal and he very generously supplied us um the relevant sections of Mal's diary and, you know, his own, uh, you know, listing of, of what occurred when during that period. So yeah, Ken was really helpful. Mm, good. Okay. So before we wrap things mm -hmm. up, since Darren and I both are wearing blue shirts, <laughs> which we didn't plan. And we mentioned Yoko's birthday. This is the new shirt from Madeline Vaccaro, which is the front cover of her book, In Your Mind, which is right over here. The Infinite Universe of Yoko Ono. And Darren is wearing... I, the I, love, that shirt. I love those shirts. Sweet. And I'm drinking out of a blue can that actually kind of matches. He's color coordinated. I don't know what that has to do with anything. Uh, should I mention the Facebook page? Oh, yeah, sure. My friends have threatened this for years, and it is now finally exists. Uh, we have a new presence on Facebook. Our new Facebook page is called Things We Said Today Video Podcast. It has the revised logo. Uh, I mean, if you've been following the show for a while, you know the, uh, the British uh, flag, the Union Jack, which has been uh, sort of the identifier that's the right proper word when you're looking for uh, us on Facebook. Uh, now we have um, a logo that was designed by a friend of mine, actually from high school, Anthony Giacone, who's uh, an, uh, in advertising. And uh, he, deci he designed this for us. And he, I'm trying to pull up a good picture of it. It just is so, he had a visual. 
And actually, um, Anthony and I lost touch when we graduated high school in 1983 and saw each other for the first time since graduation day at the Fest for Beetle fans. Um, he came by on the second day. So it was a very quick, um, very quick uh, reunion of sorts. And so he designed this logo. This will have to do here. I'm distracted trying to get this picture. But if you could see that, you know, you're looking for this on Facebook. Mm. Okay, you're looking for that logo. This is the new page, Things We Said Today, video podcast. And I emphasize that because there are two other Facebook pages that we've had forever on Facebook. And those pages will eventually someday go bye-bye. So it's all in one place. The thing is, we've got thousands of people connected to us at the older pages. So please, if you're watching right now, take two seconds, go to Facebook, find our new page and click like or follow or whatever the button says. Uh, because at some point, I won't do it right away, uh, we're going to delete those older pages. Uh, there's a, there's um, one that I actually cannot get into uh to to close out but i'll figure it out in time and again the idea is to have an updated place which is a forum for me ken and alan and you uh that has uh you know current images and uh current photographs and uh right now we have 149 i'm sorry 194 likes 434 followers we have a lot more who watch us uh so please take a moment Join Things We Said Today video podcast, our new Facebook page, so that you're not shut out uh, when the old ones uh, disappear. So. Hmm. I also would like to just say one thing, and that's to thank all the new subscribers to, uh, to our YouTube channel, because uh, as you know, we were absent for about a month and a half. And we gained like 100 subscribers without even having a new show. So thanks to all the new people listening and watching our show and also all the loyal ones from years gone by. We have over 4,000 subscribers now. And thanks to all of you for subscribing to uh, Things We Said Today. It means a lot to us. And, you know, it actually maybe speaks volumes that we picked up fans by not doing any shows. So I'm not sure exactly what that... Uh... Hmm. What you're what you're telling us that maybe we'll gain more followers without doing anything. I mean, you know, we'll go away for a year and then we'll have see how many we have a hundred thousand more subscribers. <laughs> so why don't we wrap things up by telling us what uh, what we got in store on each of our own projects and shows and things, Darren? Okay. I just celebrated my 40th anniversary at WFUV on February 26th, 1984. Um, that was when I did my first show. And, you know, it's completely a unique situation. And I understand it. And I'm, I'm very blessed and fortunate that I've had the career that I've had. Because, you know, in 84, um, WFUV was a genuine, bona fide, full-fledged college radio station. Uh, and I went to Fordham University specifically, to be honest with you, to, to work at WFUV. Um, it helped that I got in. <laughs> they could have rejected me. And then this none of this would be happening now. But um, and I was just around at the right place at the right time as changes were being made at FUV by the late 80s into 1990. And just one thing led to another and I happened to be at a meet at the right meeting at the right time or happened to be hanging out in the hallway to talk to someone at the right. And I ended up getting hired as the station was making its transition to what it is now, which is a non-commercial public station that is um, uh, owned by Fordham University, but no longer a college station in the classic sense. Um, they claim we're professionals. We all are hired and work at WFUV. So 40 years have gone by. In fact, today is what, March? We're recording this on March 3rd. <laughs> Today's the anniversary of my second show on WFUV, which was a Saturday 
March 3rd, 1984. So, but anyway, um, look for the new Facebook page for us. If you want to find me on Facebook, that's simple. There's two pages. Just Google my name or search my name rather on Facebook. Uh, send me a friend request or uh, like or follow the, uh, the other page. And uh, that's a good way for us to keep in touch. And I like to share some factoids about music in general uh, on my Facebook pages and foam at the mouth about um, Ken and my favorite baseball team, the New York Mets, and complain there. Uh, and uh, finally, if you want to listen to me on FEV, Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4 p.m. at 90.7 FM. And Alan, how's okay. Bob? Yeah, you can uh, you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can write to all of us uh, by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Um, I just posted the last show on only the new Facebook page. I don't know if I should be posting them on the old ones too, trying to sort of encourage people to go to the new one. So, Why not? Yeah. yeah. Oh. And tell us we're doing, we're, we're being nice, but we're going to stop doing this soon. The new one, yes, it is Things We Said Today video podcast, yeah. Okay, not Beatles. No, no Beatles. Things We Said Today video podcast. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that's that's pretty much it. Um, um, like I said, I'm just sort of still unwinding um, from the book, and uh, so I don't have any real projects uh, apart from the book there's um you know all the sort of clerical stuff that piled up rec records that need to be listened to and all that stuff so i'm catching up with all that gotta restring all those guitars um so just hanging out <laughs> life is <laughs> yeah i gotta spend some time listening to sean's new album right danny's new album uh, looking forward to that. If you want to get in touch with me directly, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have a Facebook page, Ken Michaels. You can friend me on there. Um, as far as my other shows on my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I just did my second interview with Lori Kay. Lori was part of the team of the RKO Radio Network that conducted the very last interview with John Lennon which was with Yoko at the Dakota on December 8th of 1980. She just released a book telling her whole life story and her career working in radio, television, and film called Confessions of a Rock and Roll Name Dropper, My Life Leading Up to John Lennon's Last Interview. She is just a delight to talk to. And uh, she not only interviewed John and Yoko, but she first interviewed George Harrison, then George Martin, then Paul McCartney and Wings, and that led to John and Yoko. And so she talks about all that in the book and in my interview with her, as well as other people that she worked for, including uh, Dick Clark, for example. Um, real fascinating uh, story, and those of us who are in the business, especially radio people, you can relate to all that she went through. Uh, in the book. Also, Talk More Talk, my other talk show podcast. Uh, we just did a show um, from the Fest for Beatle fans, which was recently posted. That was our panel where we talked about 1974 and the solo Beatles. That was actually Talk More Talk combining with Tom Hunyadi and Annie Nichols of Two Legs, the Paul McCartney uh, podcast. So that's up, and we're doing a show. Um, tomorrow on monday which will be a little late for george harrison's birthday and we should be talking about uh our favorite george harrison lyrics from his career beatles and solo also if you want to listen to every little thing which is my syndicated beatles radio show the easiest way to do so is to go to wfdu's website that's fairly dickinson university's website in new jersey it's wfdu.fm where they post my two most recent shows that aired on the radio station as part of their archival programs in fact if you really want to become familiar with that radio station all their shows are archived check out all the different titles so many different wonderful specialty shows 
that are on that station, WFDU.FM. Under the show titles, just type in every little thing, and you can find the last two shows. Okay, I think that pretty much covers everything. Okay, thanks, Ken. So um, that was catching up with the news. And then from now on, we'll have it as part of the show. Uh, we still have our uh, uh, panel from Fest to post, um, which we'll do fairly soon. And uh, okay, so for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.